All right, let's get this started. My name is Fred Dotson of realitycreation.org. On behalf of Subconscious Mind Mastery, and today I will be interviewing my special guest, Thomas Miller. And here's how I got the idea. I've been interviewed by this guy for the last 10 years. It's always him asking the questions. And I thought, why don't I ever get to be the other role? So we had this idea to reverse roles. And I'm very happy. Uh, this is my revenge. I get to ask. He doesn't know what questions I'm asking. Just like I never knew what questions he was asking. Hello, Thomas Miller. Hi, Fred. Thank you for having me on. It's good to be with you. <laughs> All right, here we go. I got loads of questions for you. You have no idea what's coming. I have okay? no idea. This is going to be very interesting. <laughs> So, Thomas, you've uh, narrated my books for the last 10 years. I was always curious. I never ask you, but I've always been curious. Of all those books that you've narrated for me, what was your favorite book? Going to surprise you. Lives of the Soul. Wow. I didn't see that coming. You see, this whole interview is already worth it. <laughs> I didn't see, see that coming. But I've had 10 years to stump the champ. So, <laughs> no, I really don't know these questions. Lives of the soul, and I'll tell you why. Levels of energy is the base of your work. So if anybody wants to understand the whole premise of everything that you do, they have to get the whole levels of energy. And there are four books in that series. So... I would start, recommend to anybody, everybody says, what book should I start with? Levels of Energy, because that's the base. But I had this Christian upbringing that I really didn't let go of until I was near 50 years old. And one of the things about that programming was a belief in heaven and hell based on a particular decision, whether you accept or or reject or don't accept Jesus as your Savior before you die. And that programming stayed with me. Uh, my brother and I never rebelled against our upbringing. And Lives of the Soul was like the final pop of that bubble. And it gave me the context to understand that there is so much more when we leave this incarnation, when we leave this life, what happens and then the whole preparation to even come back again. For what reason? Why would we want to come back? It makes you face the possibility that that exists, that we come back more than once. So there were so many things about it that just really kind of shattered the glass ceiling for me. And that's what opened up then all these other possibilities. Oh, okay. So rather than getting you to religion and got you away from it, that's interesting. <laughs> I guess it's de it depends where you're coming from in the first place, whether you're coming from one extreme or the other. That's very interesting. I like that answer. And I like the fact that uh, the book is completely unexpected. I would have said 10 other books before I said that. So my next question, unrelated to the previous one, who do you think you are when you narrate? <laughs> what I mean by that is, is there a narrator that you emulated when you were younger? I studied under Scott Brick, who is one of the top narrators in the country. The year before I met you, I did a class with him and Pat Fraley out in Los Angeles. Also, really studied a guy by the name of Grover Gardner. Grover started back in the days of narrating for the blind. And that's how audiobooks really got their start was when they when people were narrating books for the blind, you would volunteer to go do it. So Grover, back 10 years ago, had over 800 titles that he had wow. narrated. So between Scott, who was kind of like the phenomenon, and then Grover basically shaped my early style. But then I had to throw all of that out the window because I realized I'm trying to be like these other guys. And what finally clicked was, I have to be me. You know, I'm representing you. 
audibly. But one thing that Scott did say that I would say this is probably the key to being a good audiobook narrator is in that course in Los Angeles, Scott said that what you want to do is you want to be invisible to the listener. And he gave a great example. He wow. talked about a book that he had narrated that the story was built around a New York City cop. <laughs> he said that he purposefully did not do a New York accent for the cop. He just was kind of neutral. Yeah, you, you can imagine the New York accent if the guy's neutral. True. He said he got more comments from people that said, I love the way you did that cop accent. <laughs> because he got out of the way and exactly what you said, he let people hear it their way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I always try to do. I try to uh, just be as fly on the wall as possible. Speaking of books, have you ever thought of writing one yourself? Well, I did. I started it in 2005 completed it right after I went to Aspen in early 2016. Did I say 2015? 2015 is when I started it. And I finished it right after I went to Aspen. I remember finishing it in the lobby bar area there of the Jerome Hotel. It was fun, kind of nostalgic for folks who have are aware of the Jerome and Aspen and its history. The book was called Fear Busters. And I basically went through a number of subconscious mind programming things um, to remove fear. And the reason I chose that was because fear was such a paradigm for me. And, and the one thing that kind of drove every subconscious battle that I had, decision that I had, was all through fear. So I wrote it therapeutically, self-therapeutically. And then also just because I wanted to go through the process of creating a Kindle book and creating a print book and all of the things. That was the only one I've done. And the reason... Oh, wait a minute. Are you telling yeah. me this book is out on the market? It is. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's been out for, what, six years now, I guess. I'm asking in the assumption you've never put a book out. I did not know that. I don't know anything about this guy. Good thing we're doing the interview. <laughs> Good question. Wow. <laughs> Fear busters, huh? But I went through the whole process, but then you kept writing and I kept narrating and that seems to be a really good combination. And so I just uh, was like, well, I've got other things that can come out someday, but right now the focus, well, because when I was in Aspen, so 2016, 17, 18 and through there is when we really, the curve went way up and we got a lot of books out. So that's what the work was about. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the author of Fear Busters online with us today. So I can still get that book right now. Yes. Okay. Audible and iTunes and Amazon. All right. If you ever write a book again, what might that be? I'm looking at a couple of things. You know that I've taken a turn toward really appreciating God's finger in the sky, uh, astrology as a map, as a guide. And sometimes people will say, in fact, well, what about reality creation? Aren't we, don't we create our reality? How does astrology fit into that? Actually, you've answered the question many times in analogies in your books. When you talk about, like, we're driving on a big hundred lane wide highway and you can choose which lane you're going to drive, but there are many possibilities. And that's really what, to me, it shows. It's kind of like having a Google map for our soul life. But I think what one that I would tackle would be how to raise conscious children, because that's one of the heartbeats of what I do with the podcast and the, everything is knowing when I see a young family come in, I know that we get that whole family is going to be raised consciously. And that means the next generation. That's passing the torch. And those kids are going to need consciousness because they're going to be growing up in obviously a rebuilding kind of world, a tough world. And so to be able to empower families to raise conscious kids is a real heartbeat for me. And you've taught me well to follow what's on your heart. You've always said you write books because they're in your heart to write and because you don't like what's out there or there's, or there's nothing out there. 
And I think this fits that same kind of category. It's really great hearing you talk when you're not prepared. It's less controlled, more authentic. I like that. <laughs> I'm not prepared. I just heard that we were doing this. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> My secretary so, told me we had an appointment here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm writing a, uh, staying with books, I'm writing a book on healing at the moment. Uh, it's, it's almost done, be out in a few weeks. Have you, Thomas Miller, ever experienced a miracle healing in the distant or recent past? Well, I would say that my life itself has been a miracle healing because I was headed down a bad path and I had to turn it around. How bad? <laughs> two divorces, trail of tears, um, two kids that would barely stick with me, uh, two nickels that would not rub together without a loan officer in between them, bad health, doing bad things to my body, et cetera. How bad is that? <laughs> Pretty bad, huh? <laughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was like, this isn't going to continue. This has to change. So that would be one. Now, that's a soul healing, but... I literally, I mean, the, the whole story is late 2007, second divorce, 2008, shook my fist at God for a year and then realized, dude, you got to get it together. And I decided to just unbelieve as best I could everything that I had believed up until then. There's a Seinfeld episode. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's called George Does the Opposite. A little clip on YouTube. I've talked about it a lot. Oh, I've seen it. Yeah. So, George, you know, Seinfeld tells George, if what you're doing now doesn't get you the result that you want, why don't you do the opposite? Maybe you will get what you want. So I started doing the opposite in a lot of things in my life. And that's how I kind of began the turnaround. <laughs> well, it's true. If your life's not working, it must work if you do the exact opposite. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's some of the best psychological advice buried up in a Seinfeld episode. Mm -hmm. So I started, I, I started that in 2009, found that in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012. So for four years, I had just been chipping away at it as best I could. And then one day I got this intuitive pulse to email you to ask if you would be interested in getting some of your books on audio. And that was in the summer of 2013. And your work completely transformed my life. Hmm. So, Thomas, um, did you have any specific miracle healing? Because that's, that's ah, general. Yes, that's your to, yes, 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 yes. But do you have something in specific? Well, the one that is continually amazing me is my vocal cords were diagnosed by a couple of otolaryngologists that they don't close all the way. It's a typical disease that older men get, men more so than women, but it produces a uh, kind of a raspy, airy kind of voice. And I just, in good old reality creation technique kind of way, had manifest that that would heal without surgery. And over the past what, six or seven, eight months, I am able to use my voice in any kind of way that I need to, um, resting it properly, but I can use my voice in any kind of way that I choose through the day without that impacting it. So I feel that that has fully healed. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> without a scar <laughs> in my throat. <laughs> awesome. 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 Uh, my books, next question, my books becoming increasingly crazy. Have you ever been embarrassed to be associated with them? Not a bit. No? Not okay. one, not for an inkling. I need to work harder then. <laughs> Keep pushing. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your primary goal for the next 10 years? If I may inquire national prominence. So Bob Proctor was one of the other early voices that in 2009 
when I was actually, I don't know if you knew this in 2009, see history repeats itself, right? In 2009, I bought an RV. It was a fifth wheel, but I bought an RV. It was predominantly fear driven, but that whole year, that calendar year I spent in the RV, mostly in the Dallas Fort Worth area, but that was where I changed. That's where I basically unpacked my whole life was during the year in that first year in the RV. And of course, I've got another one now, a van that's much nicer. But it was in that RV that I met Bob Proctor. And I'd never Hmm. heard of Bob Proctor. And The Secret. And I watched the movie The Secret. And all these things that started to point toward that we create our own reality and we're responsible for our own life. Remember, I had been brought up in a culture that you surrender your life to God and Jesus runs your life and you pray and sometimes prayers get answered. So Bob Proctor just recently passed away and he had this international prominence mostly through the media that he did. He was on the movie and then had a huge YouTube presence. My thing has always been radio. I've loved radio since I was a kid. And I remember Paul Harvey being interviewed by Larry King. And in the introduction, Larry King talked about all the audience, 20 million people a week listening to Paul Harvey. And this was when he was in his mid-80s. And Larry King said he's even piped in to the International Space Station by the astronaut's request. Well, I want to be on a level where this work is getting out through my voice, my healed voice, through podcasts, through radio broadcasts, even to the International Space Station. Well, so be it. So be it. Mm -hmm. So be it. So that's your goal. What's your favorite non-work activity? Hiking. Hiking. Mm. And hiking on an incline. So I just am in boxes here. You're you're inclined to hike on inclines. I'm inclined to hike on a hill because it takes my little heart and makes it beat real fast. And, you know, the heart is a muscle. And so I figure that the best exercise for me is to be strengthening that by pushing it to its, you know, to some limits. And I know you can do that in a gym. I've never been a gym person. Even when I was a teenager, I was never a gym person. But man, I'm an outdoor person and I love to get on a hiking trail and just go. Does does a hiking trail get you into a certain state? If so, what state is that? I really connected with this when I spent nearly three years in Aspen total meditative, totally connected to intuition. In fact, I developed this on the hiking trails in Aspen. And here's what I had to do. This is funny. You're going to laugh at this. Get out on the hiking trail and intend that I was going to connect inside. But the monkey chatter would keep going, right? So I'd stop. Now I'm by myself. I don't have pets. So I'm just, I'm out there by myself. And I would stop and I would say, hold on a minute here. And I'd look up at an object in front of me, like a tree or a rock or something. And I would say to myself, are you willing to calm it down and to be quiet until we get to that tree? Yes. Take about four steps. (laughs) Here it would go. I'd I'd say, stop again. And I'd say, wait a minute. We had a deal. We had a deal that you were going to be quiet and you were going to let the intuitive side come up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Are you still in agreement? All right. Now we got to go past the tree, okay, to that rock up there. And finally, and it took months, like over 12, to really get this down, that I would then be able to go out on the hiking trail and immediately just turn the noise down and let the inside speak. And I can still do that today. So once once I crossed that threshold was like riding a bicycle. I owned it. Hmm. Wow. Can you uh, share one paranormal experience that you've had, Thomas? I never really have. That's one that, um, you know, like lucid dreaming. You've talked about lucid dreaming a lot in your books. I have not crossed that bridge yet. Okay. 
uh, have not had alien experiences. I know you well, have okay. multiple in, in times. That case, but, in that case, what's the strangest thing that's ever happened to you? Ooh, even since I've been up here in North Carolina. So this is fresh. This is in the last two years, a uh, year. Actually, okay, no, the last 12 months that I've done some real serious parallel universe field jumping or quantum jumping or however you want to term it, where I was able to connect with parallel realities out there on the hiking trails. Wow. And actually connected with doppelgangers or replications of myself in that other reality and dialogue with myself. And that was really strange. I mean, that was like, whoa, okay. I'm talking with myself in another reality. That person has a different experience. They're in a different circumstance, in a this different is location. Without, this is without psychedelics? Totally. Okay. <laughs> I've never done, yeah, I've never done that. I've never done them. But, well, and... It's what happens when you spend a lot of time riding around in a, in a van, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this was pre-van stuff. This is this is hiking up in oh, the okay. mountains in North Carolina. Oh, okay. What it is, Fred, is it's practicing the stuff that you've written about in all the books where I basically just implement that where I think that the uh, internal connection is able to be accessed easier. Well, can you get more specific? What was the actual process well, of what happened and what you did to experience that? What I was looking for was some completion around a past relationship. Hmm. And it was a soul-based relationship. So I knew that there was more than just boy meets girl to this relationship. So I figured in this one particular case, there had to be other realities. Well, I knew there were other realities because there had been readings and et cetera where those realities had come up. So I just decided to jump into the space or open up to the possibility that there's another version of me that was with this person successfully where mm -hmm. we had decided to, to end our time together, this incarnation. So I went to Grandfather Mountain people who know North Carolina know of Grandfather Mountain and was hiking on some of the backside trails up there on Grandfather and long hiking trail that goes up toward the top. And I just set the intention to connect. So as I was walking, I just started asking, are you there? Is there another version? Are you there in another reality? And it came, started to come through. And I mean, the dialogue was as clear as you and I are talking here. What that other person told me was a couple of past life things we had known from readings and from just intuition. But he told, oh, and by the way, they were together, had been together for 30 years and had six kids. So they had made it work. They'd built a family. I my, see. my doppelganger and this former partner. What he told me was that there was more that I didn't know that hadn't come up, but that they had discovered and had been able to work through. And it actually involved some sexual infidelity that resulted in a conception that resulted in either a miscarriage or an abortion, a terminated pregnancy that had also shown up in the form of a miscarriage in my own existence where this child had come through again that had appeared in various places and that a lot of this was around sexual karma and i knew that to be case to be the case in this reality now here was the kind of the weird part you talk about paranormal so i figured i was left incomplete here with this relationship so here i am dialoguing with this other version of me tell, and he's telling me this stuff. And this is where the hike had to extend because I was like having to, having to digest all of this. By this time I had gone up and I had turned around. So I was coming back down. And what dawned on me was to ask, well, then, okay, 
I'm feeling incomplete in this incarnation, in this physical, in this reality, but you are complete in that reality. And by the way, I was able to talk to her in that reality, and she gave me assurances that it was okay, that this stuff had been bridged. So I then asked, can I transpose your completion into my current reality, into my current space? And both gave me the blessing to do that. Well, I'm going to get choked up. (laughs) Wow. Both gave me the blessing to do that. So in essence, I walked off that mountain complete in that relationship. Well, thanks for sharing, Thomas. That's that's wild. Hmm. That's some nice uh, self therapy there. Well, that was parallel universes of self. You know, that's Self-coaching. what that book is about. Yep. That's the application of parallel universes of self. Yeah. Ultimately, it is about self coaching. I want to. That's exactly what I want to see readers do. I want to see readers hike up a mountain and self coach. That is beautiful. So. Um, Let's move on to the next question. There's always more. Is there any unwritten book you'd like to narrate? You say, oh, I'd I'd love to narrate that. Oh, wow. Okay, now you've got a good question. I know one of your dilemmas with so many books out, you know, as people come and they say, well, where should I begin? What should I start with? I think you have a brand or a franchise around levels of energy. And I've met very few people who comment on hearing or reading that book that they don't say that it absolutely changes their life. And I know you've written several expansions of it, but that can go in so many different directions. It can go to homes and families. It can go to businesses. It can go to personal health. How do we treat our bodies? There are just so many slice and dice applications of that. It's almost like chicken soup. Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen Mm. wrote. So, you know, they they wrote the basic, here's the first volume. And then, I mean, there was chicken soup for your kids on their tricycle and (laughs) chicken soup for your pets and chicken soup for your doppelganger and everything, right? It's like chicken soup for everything. Well, yeah. that's levels of energy. Well, that, yeah, I, I, we are, we've already talked about this and you've already suggested it years ago, actually. And I did not comply <laughs> because um, I guess if I were a business person or a marketer, it would be great. But um, there's so many other things I'd like to explore. You see, it's not the only thing there is. Um, I I I think think actually maybe, yes. And as you continue to explore and you're pushing the envelope out, one of the other things that I would like to see is maybe like, I just love the books that you write. Whatever you throw down is great. And you have surprised lately. It's like, you know, these twists and turns have been totally unique, like extraterrestrial linguistics. Looking into language originations has been phenomenal. One of the things that I'd like to see, and I don't know that I'll live long enough to see it, hopefully, some of it, is for society and consciousness to catch up with where you are. Because you're many steps ahead. So you're leading us where we're going. Got to pull the consciousness up. And that means changes. And we know that we're in changes right now. So we well, welcome actually, these changes. That's actually one of the questions on my list here. Um, what do you think the next 10 years hold for humanity? Well, using the Google map of the soul, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I don't even know if this story is accurately portrayed, but the nativity scene in the Bible talks about three Persian magi coming to the manger scene to acknowledge the newborn king. They were astrologers, and they said, we saw your star in the sky, we came. Looking at the signs of the stars in the sky, it looks like we're under some challenges ahead. But I think that the outcome of those challenges, whatever they are, 
my gosh, we've had pandemic. We've already got that one off the list. We're sitting on the edge of a world war. We've got an economy that, you know, so many people say is going to collapse. Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? But as we look out beyond that, every time in history that these configurations have been present, the outcome was not only better, was substantially better. So I think in the long run, maybe 20, 30, 40 years even as much, we are headed for much better days as far as consciousness and the reality of being on planet Earth will change for the better. But we got to go through the tunnel. Hmm, interesting. I, I tend to agree. All right. It's been awesome. One final question unrelated to anything, since everybody's sharing their uninformed opinion on Elon Musk these days while we're doing this interview. <laughs> what is Thomas Miller's view on Elon Musk? Is Elon Musk a good guy, bad guy? Is he just a front for something else? Um, is he the savior or the opposite of that? Who is Elon Musk? What is your take on Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> when I see Elon Musk, I think of Fred Dodson. <laughs> a lot of people tell me you look like Elon Musk. I find that funny because I don't see any resemblance whatsoever. So here's, but let's take that farther. I have always seen a, you know, like a cousin, like it's not brothers. You couldn't be brothers, but you could be in the same bloodline of some sort. What you have done to consciousness, he has done to business. Total innovator. Look at what he started with. PayPal. Right. He just thinks outside the box in the same kind of way that you think outside the box. And he's able to put products and services together to uh, bring those to reality, just like you're able to create books that take us to new dimensions in our consciousness. So I do see that the two of you are quite similar, just in different fields. So to me, he's every bit the innovator. He's every bit the rule breaker. He's every bit the pioneer. He beats to his own drum. Don't try to explain anything as typical or normal. He just is who he is. And that's a lot of the way that you are. Yeah, quite unexpected. So I think what he will do with this new Twitter acquisition, he'll clean up a lot of the things that people had been moving away from Twitter or been frustrated with Twitter about is um, just this seeming authoritarianism around it. I think he'll disappear that pretty quickly. Yeah, I think so too. My shadow, my 10 year shadow ban is finally lifted. <laughs> Seriously. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Finally. Now, anyway. if he could just get, if he could take control of Facebook and clean that one up. <laughs> <laughs> So Thomas Miller on Elon Musk, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'm done with the interview. Thank you very much. It was a strange experience for me. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Thomas Miller, author of Fear Busters. Who would have known? Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for having me, Fred. I enjoy your podcast. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I'm Fred Dotson. Enjoy the journey.